Russia's invasion of East Ukraine has forced hundreds of thousands of people to flee their homes. But what is the government doing about this? Is it coping? And also, what rights do these displaced people have? And how are they different to those fleeing the war in Syria to Europe? Joining us here on Ukraine Today in our studios on Viewpoint is Maxim Butkevich, the co-founder of the NGO No Borders Project. Maxim, thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you for hosting me and inviting me. Uh, so I wanted to, first of all, talk to you about uh, the refugees that are fleeing eastern Ukraine. Uh, now we have the ceasefire that's relatively holding. So what's the latest situation now? Well, the situation didn't really change uh, significantly in the last few months. Uh, but first, we have to understand whom we are talking about. Uh, the biggest group fleeing the war zone uh, are internally displaced persons, IDPs, uh, they are called in bureaucratic lingua. And currently, their number is a bit above uh, one million and a half, maybe one million six hundred thousand. Also, we have uh, those who would be qualified as refugees, those who had to flee to Russia or other countries, and their total number is about one million. Mm. And um, no, your organization works to help these refugees. Um, what sort of areas do you focus on exactly? What sort of help do you give to these refugees? Well, we started uh, working with, with an issue in March uh, 2014, last year, straight after the beginning of the occupation of Crimea. Mm -hmm. And at the time, of course, the numbers were totally different. We tried to assist people with housing in mm. the first place, because this is what, what they needed. This is the main thing. The main yeah. thing uh, mm -hmm. originally, and um, at the time the process of resettlement was not as painful as it became later for people uh, from Donbass. Mm. We tried to connect people who needed housing with those who would offer mm. uh, their flats or their houses, their, their, their corners, I don't know, whatever, uh, for people to stay. And there were a lot of them, I should mm. say. So. Uh, even our small organization, we are quite small, mm. uh, managed to assist a few thousands. But persons. now this is changing. Now you're moving on to other areas. We then worked last winter with the humanitarian assistance and also tried to redistribute uh, requests for legal aid mm. and other sources of aid with uh, our partner organizations who work mm. in the same area. And uh, uh, I, I should say we are worried uh, expecting this winter. Winter time is threatening for those who experience hardship. It's the harshest time. Of exactly. So percent. last winter was kind of merciful, mm. was quite soft, but we don't know what to expect from this winter. Mm. And currently we try to assist those organizations who try to work assisting IDPs in uh, uh, not necessarily rural areas, but not in the capital, not in big mm. cities, uh, but still in eastern regions. Yeah. And uh, these are often the regions that are missed out. I wanted to um, ask you about um, your experiences with speaking with these refugees. The war has been going on now for 18 months and uh, the government has been implementing uh, new laws and new policies. But in, from the refugees' point of view, is it getting easier or tougher to apply for refugee status? Uh, well, when it comes to IDPs, uh, they do not need uh, special status as, as refugees. They are citizens of Ukraine, most of them. So they have the same rights uh, as all Ukrainian nationals. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, it's better for them mostly to be registered as IDPs because this secures uh, certain procedures of, of assistance. And do you mean that registering your car, your passport, these sorts of documents? Uh, we dealt with people in very different situations and of course there were those who lost all their papers either during the fighting mm. or their house was bombed yeah. uh, to pieces. So how do they deal with this? And, and they had to papers? leave. It became much more dangerous to leave the area with no documents. But mm. when they arrived to, to the safe zone or to safe mainland, mm -hmm. they have to restore all of them. And it is quite difficult and burdensome bureaucratic Because you can't procedure. get back to um, Luhansk or Donetsk regions. Exactly. Sometimes it's dangerous for them. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we've heard stories when they were told by some local officials that they should go back in mm. order to get certain documents and to bring them, for instance, to prove their identity. Mm. Uh, fortunately, these uh, cases are not 
uh, 100%, mm -hmm. but, but it happens from time to time. So they have to encounter difficult bureaucratic procedures and all the painful moments of integration into receiving communities. Mm. I wanted to ask you for our viewers who are not aware, what, what is the difference between a refugee and an internally displaced person exactly? Uh, the differences are legal and political. Mm -hmm. So legally, a refugee is a term from 1951 UN Refugee Convention. And the first thing is that a refugee should uh, uh, find him or herself outside of the country of his or her origin or nationality. Mm. And second, uh, there are international documents in international legislation uh, which are obligatory for the states. Uh, they are obliged to protect refugees, but mm. there are no such documents when it comes to IDPs. Mm. So this is a legal one and political one relates to the to the first one, when someone says refugees from Crimea mm. uh, in Ukraine, uh, in mainland Ukraine, that basically means that the person uh, recognizes Crimea not being part of Ukraine. And for many people in Ukraine currently, it's unacceptable. Yeah. And the government recognizes them as IDPs. As IDPs. Yeah. So when we talk about refugees, and we also deal with refugees these days, uh, refugees from other countries who try to seek asylum in Ukraine. And it just happened to be so that our organization mostly worked with people from former Soviet Union countries. Mm. And, and, it's, and it's not just internally displaced people within Ukraine itself, but also there are Russians who are fleeing to Ukraine and your organization has encountered these people. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Exactly. Uh, and, and they have some concerns and some worries similar to IDPs but most of their concerns are, they are different. Until last year, actually, we dealt with mostly with nationals of other countries. And it's only last year was the first one when vast majority of those who came to us were Russian nationals. Mm. Uh, most of them are opponents of current Russian political regime. And they're under persecution. Uh, some of them were arrested many times for participation in peaceful assemblies or rallies. Uh, had their homes, houses been searched, mm. the stuff confiscated and been under threat of uh, more serious persecution, so they had to leave. Mm. And they are from very different regions of Russia, I should say. It's not only Moscow and St. Petersburg. Mm. Uh, it's also Ural, it's Siberia, and it's not necessarily big cities. It's also some small towns, and they have different social uh, segments or, or classes. Mm. Uh, so I, 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 sh I cannot say that there is one homogeneous yep. portrait of okay. a Russian And refugee. I see on your T-shirt that you're wearing there, it says free Crimean hostages. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about your work, about you know, trying to uh, get them freed? Yeah, Crimean hostages, just to remind the, those who maybe uh, have uh, heard uh, less about the case, it's so-called Crimean terrorists case. Mm. Uh, Oleg Sensov, uh, film editor, mm. Alexander Kolchenko, social activist, Gennady Afanasyev, a young photographer, and Oleksiy Cherny were arrested by Federal Security Service of Russia last May. In Crimea, in but Crimea, then taken to Russia. But they were taken to Russia. What are the, the hopes for a fair trial? I mean, it doesn't really exist, does it? Well, two out of the four are already sentenced to seven years mm -hmm. uh, of uh, uh, special regime, so-called. Mm -hmm. uh, and they cooperated with, uh, with uh, Federal Security Services. Basically, yeah. they signed whatever, whatever was needed. And two others, Oleg Sensov and Alexander Kolchenko, mm. denied all the allegations which are recognized by our Russian colleagues. And do you think it's absurd? Do you think Ukraine is doing enough to try and get their release and organizations like yourselves? That's a good question. I should say that Ukraine, especially recently, accelerated efforts on the government level to try mm. to influence them. But uh, there is very little room for maneuver. Mm -hmm. uh, in the first place, Russia uh, as a state does not recognize them being Ukrainian citizens. Really? Their citizenship is forcibly taken away from them. Well, so they become Russian? Russian because they, Straight away. Because they are from Crimea. But wasn't Crimea, there an option after the annexation? You could either become Russian or hold a Ukrainian passport as well? Or did they all have to flee? One, one out of four actually went through this procedure and kept Ukrainian nationality, mm. but others said that this is procedure uh, installed by occupational forces and they are not going to follow it. Okay. And also that somehow they are not people who are attached to the land, they cannot mm. be bought and sold with the land. Okay, excellent. Uh, Maxim Bukevich, thank you very much for coming on Viewpoint.
That was Maxime Bukevich, the co-founder of the NGO No Borders Project. This is Viewpoint. Now back to the news.